uh, thank you for the in, uh, invitation, Ulf. I like to tell you a little bit about uh, some of our recent work on trying to get at the mechanisms of speciation in these crater lake cichlids in uh, Nicaragua. Um, Cichlids are well known as a model system uh, for all kinds of issues related to this conference, speciation, adaptive radiations, and so on. Most uh, people of you, I presume, know about the African cichlids, um, which are shown, uh, some of which are shown here, there are about 3,000 or so species. One of the more interesting aspects of cichlid biology is not only that they speciate uh, very, very fast, but also that they show repeated patterns of evolution, as you can see here. These are all cichlids that are endemic to Lake Tanganyika. These are all endemic to Lake Malawi. And so to me, one of the more interesting questions is to ask how ecologically, um, um, what are the ecological pressures that bring about this uh, parallelism or convergence, and how developmentally or genomically do you do this? Now, cichlids not only live in Africa, although most of them do. There are a few hundred that live in Central and South America. And since my PhD work, I've been working on these crater lake cichlids in uh, Nicaragua. Um, there are two large lakes in Nicaragua, Lake Managua, uh, here shown here, about 40 kilometers in length, and, uh, and Lake Nicaragua, about 120 kilometers in length. Um, over the last 20 years or so, we've collected all kinds of fish from not only the large lakes, but of course the crater lakes that I'll come to in a moment, but I'd first like to show you sort of the biogeographic setting in which um, all of this acts. One of the beautiful aspects about this whole system is that we have repeated um, um, experiments going on in this chain of crater lakes here. Um, this is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Um, Nicaragua is a very unstable country in more than one way. Um, the craters start up here in El Salvador, and once the, once the craters go extinct, they fill up with water, and often they're colonized by fish. Um, in particular, the cichlid fishes that I'll tell you about, this uh, particular species complex called the Midas cichlid species complex, manages to speciate in these crater lakes. Interestingly enough, as far as we know, other cichlids and other fam families of fishes that also colonize these lakes do not speciate. So there's an interesting question that we don't have an answer for yet, why it is that only this one group does it. But maybe we have some hints for this. In any event, so remember there are two large lakes and there's this chain of uh, crater lakes that we're interested in. This is the diversity that one sees there. So the first species were described in 1860s by Gunther and then Meek, who went there in the early 19th century. Um, they threw up their arms and said, well, if we see all this diversity, you can pile them in one pile or in, in 20 different piles. Um, some of the variation you can see here. In, in the two large lakes, there are two species described. One is called Citronellus, that's the main species. And then there's this other species here with these pronounced lips called labiatus. As you notice, the, both of these species come in an orange gold morph and in the dark, what we call normal morph, because the normal morph is uh, far more common. About 90% in some populations, 98 or so percent of the individuals are black, uh, and about, uh, let's say, less than 1%, up to 10% are gold. Now, um, I'll come back to this in a moment, but here you can already see in some of the crater lakes there are three, four, five species, and that's changing and increasing uh, continuously, and there are more species to be described um, and will be described soon. Now, I just came back from Nicaragua on Sunday, and, and this slide is uh, about 100 fish of presumably one species from the Great Lakes. So this is all Citronellus from Lake Nicaragua, and you can see the gold morphs here in the middle, and you can see the dark morphs here, but the dark morphs on, on the, in this right uh, uh, line here are not the same as the two or three other <laughs> phenotypic groups on the, on the left side. Now, we just published a sort of overview that summarizes some of this phylogeographic setting, just to sort of um, know where we are. And this is based on over 2,000 samples, and I'd just like to highlight some of the issues. The, uh, both large lakes are relatively old, probably half a million years old. The six crater lakes that we uh, looked at in this study uh, vary in age between maximally about 20,000 to uh, less than 2,000 years, despite the fact that in probably all of these lakes there are uh, uh, um, um, endemic species. Um, here are the sample sizes that I don't have time to get into for this particular study. When I was a graduate student in the early Pleistocene, there were three species described, Citronellus, Lavietus, and this third species called Zaleosus. That species was the first endemic species to be described in this one crater lake called Apoyo, and that's something that we've published about. 
One of the th reasons why I became interested in this was this color polymorphism because it's known, uh, at least from lab work, and we've collected some data from the field, that um, gold females like gold males, and almost all of the pairs that you find will be mated assortatively. They are um, disassortatively mated, but uh, they are uh, the exception rather than the rule. So this is an exceptional pair where a golden female made it with a gold, uh, black and white uh, striped male. So that's the potential for sexual selection playing a role and this, and this was one of the initial uh, reasons why I became interested in studying this. Okay, so, so much for the background. Um, if you look at Cygenellus and Labiatus, they look like two very different species. Labiatus has very pointed heads compared to Cygenellus, and here are the two different morphs. These are uh, photos that I just took last week from fish that were collected here in Lake Nicaragua. If we collect these fish in these different areas in this large lake and this large lake, we find significant population um, structure, um, despite the fact that there are presumably only two different species. And again, you can sort of see this more clearly here, a gold uh, individual uh, of Cygenellus labiatus, black la labiatus Cygenellus, look very different. However, if you do the structure analysis, we cannot tell these things apart. Uh, with 15 microsatellites, these are all fish like this from Lake Nicaragua. These are all fish of the same kind from Lake Managua. So we can tell the lakes apart, but we cannot tell the color morphs apart or whether or not they have lips or not lips. And having lips is not the only thing uh, because the head shape, as you can see, is an entirely different, very pointed, very flattened. It's, it's ecologically relevant. They feed on very different diets uh, as well. We know from lab experiments that lippy fish like li other lippy fish. So um, we also know that lippy fish have lippy be uh, offspring. Just to sort of throw this out to say, well, we don't quite know why this is. I'll come back in the last slide to phenotypic plasticity because this is something that Louis mentioned to me yesterday and asked me about because this also goes back to some um, work a generation ago. Um, so the haplotype network of this entire radiation, there's a central haplotype that is found in almost all populations, except that two crater lakes, Apoyo, that we've published about before, where we argue that there's a case of sympatric speciation due to ecological differentiation. There's another crater lake, um, Asososca Leon, um, that is also monophyletic. The other um, crater lakes shown here are to varying degrees not monophyletic. Um, Apoyeke, for example, is almost, as the Soska Managua is almost, uh, in, in terms of mitochondrial DNA. This is shown in more detail here. Um, this is published, so I'm not going to skip this uh, uh, quite quickly. Again, um, uh, mitochondrial speaking, uh, um, Apoyo is monophyletic and Asososca leon, these other four crater lakes are not. Um, in the structure analysis, they all come out as monophyletic. Most clearly Apo um, Apoyo, it's also the oldest crater lake. It's 20,000 years or so old. Uh, genetically, um, it's very distinct from the other crater lakes and from the main populations. It's very clear that what's going on in Apoyo is completely independent uh, of what's going on in the other lakes. No, so come back to this particular um, diagram. So we have crater lakes with these small radiations of three to five species in each of them. Overlayered on top of this are not only, you know, elongate species that are found in Apoyo and, for example, in Chiloa and maybe in some of the other crater lakes, but also this polymorphism that is found in sometimes one or more than one species in these crater lakes. So we have, again, ecological differentiation and um, sexual selection where we know um, the color matters. The first study we did was to focus on the origin of this species. The results we got uh, were, uh, were met enthusiastically by people with uh, uh, that it's, it's, uh, this is a case of sympatric speciation. Ernst Meyer passed away the year before we published this, but he knew about this as this, these studies, and, and Andrew and I talked about yesterday. Maybe there are more and more studies on sympatric speciation published, and I'm, of course, in some ways preaching to the converted in this group, um, has to do with the fact that Ernst Meyer is gone. Um, as you know, he was not exactly a fan of sympatric speciation. But actually, in the case of the Crater Lake cichlids, he argued that um, the onus of showing that it's not uh, sympatric speciation uh, lies with the people that strongly believe in allopatric speciation as the only means of speciation. He actually was convinced that the Crater Lake cichlids are a valid example of, uh, of sympatric speciation. I don't want to go through the arguments and the, the data that's published uh, six years ago in the case of Lake Apoyo, where we showed that there's ecological differentiation, morphometric differences that um, show um, 
uh, ecologically relevant of the, or ecologically relevant traits, such as the pharyngeal jaws in the cichlids. They are different, have differences in stomach contents. Um, they have a different um, stable isotope profile um, data we've collected since. Um, so we think that in the case of Lake Apoyo, and there are actually no goldfish in Lake Apoyo. Uh, some people say they've seen two or three uh, golds. Um, I've collected thousands of fish there. Uh, I've never seen a goldfish in that lake. But we have another lake where we think sexual selection does play a role, and we think that that is part of the reason for the origin of a new species in another crater lake called Lake Hiloa. In that lake, there are two species called Hiloensis and, and Sagite that have gold and normal uh, fish. And that lake is uh, located here. I've been talking about Apoyo so far. This is now Hiloa here. When you collect fish around the lake, and this is of course something that's important if you want to have or avo avoid arguments with people that argue about micro allopatry, whatever that is. Um, um, so we collect fish around the lakes, uh, lake shore. We look at the um, mating pattern and we can show again that there's strong assortative mating based on color in these two species. And interestingly enough, based on microsatellite variation, we can predict um, the color of these fish. Um, um, to some extent. So we believe that this may be incipient speciation um, that is possibly driven by sexual selection. It's probably not the entire story um, since we're always also finding some morphometric differences and some ecological the differences between these species. So it's probably a combination of both ecological and sexual selection that's driving this. So the structure analysis of the species that are endemic to this lake also shows with more noise than Apoyo um, that we can even distinguish gold and normal morphs of the same species from each other. Now, back to the what I think is the, one of the more interesting aspects of all of this, the parallel evolution. As I've said, each of the small radiations in these crater lakes is dependently, independently derived from the ancestral population from these large lakes that got to these lakes somehow. We can discuss this later. We've done a morphometric analysis of all of the fish and all of the lakes. And interestingly enough, um, you can tell based on the morphology um, where most species are formed with some degree of certainty. Um, so this shows the uh, seven or eight species that are known from Chiloa and Ap Apoyo crater lakes. And to show the overlap, uh, between some of the benthic and some of the limnetic species. So we have the independent evolution of benthic and limnetic species in each of these particular lakes. So again, we know there was a generalist, most likely, because the limnetic form does not exist in the large lakes, or at least in a very low frequency. The generalist, the benthic species, colonized these two crater lakes and then formed these small radiations where you can find ecologically um, equivalent species in both of these uh, systems. You have the limnetic piscivore open water species, and you have the more benthos oriented associated um, benthic uh, morphs. They can be genetically distinguished, both the lakes from each other and all the species from each other with several types of markers we've used, ALFLP, uh, microsatellites, and what have you. The question is, can we find genes responsible for these similarities in these two different radiations. And um, so we've characterized some of the ecology in terms of stomach contents, uh, stable isotopes, and so on. And we've begun to use a transcriptome ap approach as one of our approaches to look for the genetic basis of these uh, differences. So we started with a, a first pair of benthic uh, limnetic species from one crater lake, the older crater lake, Lake Apoyo. Um, did 454 sequencing, discovered um, some shared ASTs, about 13,000. And then we can look for um, signs for directional selection, so suspiciously high KAKS ratios. And we found something like 13 genes that may provide uh, some uh, differences between these species. They tend to be very boring things like metabolism or energy transport related genes, whatever that means. So the next step then was, if we look at another species pair from Lake Hiloa that's also limnetic and benthic, um, this lake is only 6,000 years old, what genes are come up in, uh, will come up in this kind of analysis? So we have this pairwise comparisons of species pairs, of ecologically equivalent species pairs that we analyze uh, in, in this particular way. 
So we come up with another set. This was done with uh, uh, longer reads and the higher throughput. So we get a, 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 we get a larger number of ESTs uh, that overlap. But it turns out that 11 of those 14 candidate genes that came up in the first comparisons were identical in the other species pair comparison. Seemingly, this is of course not entirely conclusive, but seemingly ruling out that these potential candidate genes actually are responsible for bringing about these phenotypic differences between these two uh, uh, species. So what we end up concluding is that there's strong ecological divergence, there's a strong divergence selection that brings about these phenotypes. Um, but that the molecular underlying mechanisms that bring about these differences are different in these two different um, um, and in these two different systems, potentially involving different genes or and or different mechanisms in terms of regulatory versus uh, amino acid substitutions. So we're continuing along these lines with other um, next-gen approaches and other. Um, um, uh, um, developmental approaches to try to find the genetic basis of these, uh, these differences. But I threw this in for, for Louis. Of course, we know that there is a, a large phenotypic component. We know the heritabilities of some of these traits, but we also know that phenotypic plasticity does play a large role. These are unpublished data from work that was done to feed snails to these cichlids. It turns out these cichlids are the only fish in these lakes that can cr uh, crack very hard snail shells. And if we crack the snail shells for these fish and feed them shells plus just snail meat. There's an effect on the uh, on the on the tooth form and the shape of these pharyngeal jaws of these teeth. So we are beginning to look at the um, um, underlying molecular basis by looking at epigenetic effects on particular tooth uh, shape related genes in this. So this is the direction we're going. The people whose work I've presented are shown here in bold and in italics. So Marta Baluenga was a postdoc in my lab for five years. She left 2005 to 2006. Um, Walter Salzberger was a postdoc in my lab. Some, he was involved in some of this. Moritz Muschek, Topi Leitori, uh, Andy Kaud, and particularly uh, Catherine Elmer um, are leading the charge on these particular projects. Thank you for your attention. So um, the um, candidate genes that were identified in the Apoyo comparison were identical in sequence between in the species pair of Hiloir. There were no substitutions at all. Of species, the minor cichlid species complex, are not the only cichlids. Sometimes there are two to six different species of cichlids in these lakes. And um, the minor cichlids are the only one with a color polymorphism. That is one thing that jumps out. Um, we are beginning to ask what the coalescence time is for these other cichlids. Maybe these are just very good early colonizers and, and, and are able to occupy those presu presumably empty niches that exist in these crater lakes. Um, we don't know yet if they, this could be, of course, uh, uh, have, have several causes, um, but there will be one potential explanation that they get there first, um, but we don't know at this stage. Um, no, I, I, I don't know why it is. I mean, um, that's one of the big questions for us, too. <laughs> 
No, these are not. So the African, there are mouth brooders in the New World, but uh, these species are substrate spawners. So they, they can lay, depending on the size of the female, of course, but they can lay hundreds uh, or over a thousand eggs. Um, that's a good question. George Barlow had worked on this to ask uh, how does a fish know what color their parents uh, are, for example. I should, I should say that all of the fish start out as melanized forms. So they all start out as, 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 as black and white fish. And as juveniles, they tend to school. So there's a possibility that they might be imprinted on, on, on their siblings. Except that um, at the size when they begin to disperse, um, that's when you see the, the smallest goldfish that I've seen, maybe seven or eight centimeters in size. I think that the color change from black to gold is probably um, uh, determined by predation, both by piscivore predation, because the largest fish predators in the lakes are probably gate limited to a size of seven or eight centimeters, and the avian um, predators that presumably will go just like the fish predators go more for the goldfish than the black and white fish because they're obviously much easier to see from a farther distance underwater, um, they will not be able to go so deep. It, it, it turns out that the golds tend to live deeper than the black and white striped fish. Um, so there are still some open questions in terms of how mate choice is done. Uh, Barlow has found that in lab experiments, um, the gold males have a um, a competitive advantage over the black males um, by 15%. His idea is that they intimidate the, the, the opponent and males compete for breeding sites in these, in these lakes. So there may actually be an advantage under some conditions for um, gold males. And it turns out that the mixed pairs that we do find, more often than not, the, the, um, the male is gold rather than um, normal. So maybe the normal females choose a golden male for a reason, uh, that they have a breeding territory ac acquired that they can defend, because that's very important in, um, in um, making sure that the brood will survive. There's a lot of predation on the broods in these, in these lakes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.